a lot of times people with ADHD will essentially develop adaptive strategies. They'll start to structure their life in a particular way to where the ADHD no longer impacts them. So this can be accurate, right? So that the brains of people with ADHD are loud. So let me ask you something. Is your brain louder or quieter in high stimuli or low stimuli environments? So let's take a look, right? So let's think about this. If the stimulus level is high versus low, what is the volume in your head? Okay. So what we tend to find is that when the stimulus level is high, the volume in your head is going to be low. And when the stimulus level is low, the volume in your head is going to be high. So this goes back to this other principle where basically our brain and people with ADHD will auto compensate for a lack of stimulus by increasing particular thoughts. You got to be a little bit careful because if you get too high in terms of stimulus, you'll kind of get overwhelmed. But same general principle. So if things are too, ha uh, too high, uh, if, if things are too loud in your head, just think a little bit about the stimulus. And I think it's kind of interesting because I've seen these kinds of TikToks before. In every one of these TikToks, what is the person doing? They're just sitting there like quiet. It's entirely possible. Right? You never see these TikToks with people like eating at a cafe. They're usually like at home without other people around, which is what happens. So your brain will try to overstimulate. Things I thought everyone experienced before I found out about adult ADHD. Everything is so loud and that pisses me off. Turns out you can live life on a lower volume and getting very overwhelmed by sounds in places like grocery stores is just another symptom. I'm not lazy. Do you ever have a task to do and you're kind of just sat there in your head thinking about the task but not getting the task started? That's ADHD paralysis and oh my god it's frustrating as fuck. It's not normal to have to remind yourself to pay attention when someone's talking to you. Often if someone's telling me a story halfway through or sound like they're talking simlish, and it's not that I'm being rude and not listening, it's just my brain's somewhere else, like always. So that's just a few things, let me know if you want a part two and press the plus button if you want to follow my ADHD journey from diagnosis to medication. So this once again goes back to what we're talking about, about sort of distractibility in stimuli. So the key thing about ADHD is that when people have ADHD, they, one of the symptoms, one of the diagnostic criteria is distractibility. And so what does that mean, distractibility? It means that my attention is more easily shifted from one thing to another. So subjectively, the way that people experience that with ADHD is that if you look at a neurotypical person, if I'm sitting at a cafe and I'm talking to someone across from me, my brain is able to drown out and suppress external stimuli better than someone with ADHD. So since I'm less distractible, my subjective experience is that all I'm going to hear is the person who's sitting across from me. If I have ADHD, however, since I'm more distractible, my brain is less able to suppress the other things around me. And so what that'll sort of manifest as is the sound will subjectively feel louder than it would for a neurotypical person. So here I am trying to focus on things and there's so much loud noise. And in the case of a neurotypical person, when something breaks through that sort of uh, suppression shield, for lack of a better term, that's going to correlate with higher volume, right? So if I'm sitting at a cafe and someone starts yelling, that'll break through my suppression shield and it'll sort of gain my attention. But in the case of ADHD, our suppression shield is a little bit lower. So it feels like things are louder. And that pisses me off. Turns out you can live life on a lower volume and getting very overwhelmed by sounds in places like grocery stores is just another symptom. I'm not late. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how can you live life on a lower volume. So there are a couple of different things that you can do. So, so we know that, for example, this person at the end talks about medication. So this is kind of interesting, but medication for ADHD, it's kind of weird, right? Because like, if we think about medication for ADHD, like my mind is moving too fast. And if I think about a stimulant, doesn't that cause my mind to move faster? So if I'm like a neurotypical person and I drink caffeine, my mind is going to start moving faster, right? I'm not going to be as sluggish. So sometimes people get kind of confused because how does like stimulant medication calm down the mind in people who have ADHD? 
So it turns out that actually what happens, if you look at the brain of someone with ADHD, we have our frontal lobes. And our frontal lobes actually send inhibitory signals to other parts of our brain, like our nucleus accumbens. So this is where we inhibit impulses. We also inhibit emotions through the amygdala, right? So what happens when we actually have, when we stimulate, when you add stimulant medication, is we actually stimulate our inhibitory function of the brain. We stimulate our brakes, which is why we slow down, which is why we're able to pay attention. And so if you want to live life quieter, essentially what you need to do is increase your ability to attend to a particular stimuli and not be quite as distractible, which you can do through strengthening the frontal lobes. So meditation also works for this. Okay. Amazing. Do you ever have a task to do and you're kind of just sat there in your head thinking about the task but not getting the task started? That's ADHD paralysis. And so here's, here's my concern with this is I'm noticing this trend in a lot of ADHD TikToks where people are really, really overgeneralizing. So, you know, like this is a 52 second TikTok that has three concepts in it. And so what I'm noticing is that people are just like really, really overgeneralizing. This may not be ADHD paralysis. And furthermore, ADHD paralysis is an umbrella term that means a lot of different things and has a lot of different discrete neuroscientific kind of principles. The key thing is that we know that ADHD, people with ADHD are more prone to procrastination, but even procrastination has different kinds of sources, right? So sometimes we procrastinate because we're afraid of the consequence. Sometimes we procrastinate because we're perfectionistic. Sometimes we procrastinate in the case of ADHD, which is more, more vulnerable to people with ADHD, because we don't know how to operationalize the task. It's, a, it's an executive function problem. So executive function is the part of our brain that plans and executes tasks. The challenge is that if we kind of go to the brain of ADHD, you know, when what we call ADHD paralysis may have three different origins in the brain. So it could be frontal lobe problem. It could be uh, hippocamp, I mean, sorry, uh, limbic system problem. So we know that, for example, we have difficulty restraining our emotions. We know that emotions influence the behavior of people with ADHD more. But is it essentially emotions controlling us and that's why we're paralyzed? Or do we literally not know how to get started because we feel so overwhelmed? Those are two very different things with very different solutions. And the problem with these phrases like ADHD paralysis is that if I look up solutions for ADHD paralysis, like... It's going to be all kinds of different stuff, but discreetly what's going on in the brain is going to be very, very different. We go, by the way, if y'all are interested in the neuroscience, the ADHD guide that we have coming out in 14 days has the most neuroscience heavy stuff that we've done, because I do think there's a lot to understand about different parts of your brain and targeting solutions towards your particular problem. And the reason that we go into that detail is because what I'm seeing as we go into more short form content is people just call something ADHD paralysis. And there are even studies on ADHD paralysis, but what we sort of realize if you look at those studies is that there are a lot of different mechanisms, and the solutions need to be tailored to where the problem actually is. Oh, and then it's also a little bit about social stuff, right? Um, After if someone's telling so let's take a look at this. To remind yourself to pay attention when someone's talking to you. Often if someone's telling me a story halfway through or sound like they're talking simlish, and it's not that I'm being rude and not listening, it's just my brain's somewhere else, like, always so that's just a few things okay. let me know if you so want i think the next one is also a little bit about relationships so let's take a look so let me get this straight it's actually harder to maintain friendships and relationships if you have adhd yeah because people with adhd have object pertinence like infants have when playing the game of peekaboo so if you don't see people for a long time you forget they exist yeah even the ones i love and care about the most and you also have emotional permanence on top of that. So if those people aren't constantly reassuring you that they love and care about you, you assume that they hate you? Yes, and due to my intense subconscious fear of rejection, I'll actually wind up completely socially isolating myself. But doesn't that make your depression a lot worse? Also, yes. 
So like, how do you have any friends? Honestly, I have no idea. I'm so annoying. Okay. So there's some things I like about this and some things about this that are seem very incorrect to me. On the one hand, I think this person starts out strong, right? So get this straight. It's actually harder to maintain friendships and relationships if you correct. have ADHD. This is correct. So there's actually research that goes into this, which we'll dive into in a second. But then I think this is the other problem with a lot of these TikToks is that they start to conflate a lot of different things. Okay. So ADHD has nothing to do with like being sensitive to rejection. That, that's not a diagnostic feature of ADHD. Now, are a lot of people with ADHD sensitive to rejection? Sure. But it's not due to ADHD. And why is that kind of dangerous? Let me, let me put it to y'all this way. Okay, let's just finish watching this for a second. Yeah, because people with ADHD have object pertinence. Like okay, so we just got to list this. Object permanence. Okay, that's weird. Infants have when playing the game of peekaboo. So if you don't see people for a long time, you forget they exist. I don't think that's Yeah, accurate. even the ones I love and care about the most. And you also have emotional permanence on top of that. So if those people- I've never heard the phrase emotional permanence. I don't know what that means. Is that like a new thing? TikTok is too loud. People aren't constantly reassuring you that they love and care about you. You assume that they hate you? Assume that they hate you. This has nothing to do with ADHD. Okay, let's let's keep going. You? Yes, and due to my intense subconscious fear of rejection, I'll actually wind up completely socially isolating myself. Okay, intense fear of rejection. All right, and this makes your depression worse. All right, so there's a lot of good stuff here, but there's some stuff that that. <laughs> yeah, sorry for turning it up. There's a lot of stuff here that we've got to really talk about for a second. Okay, so I'm pretty sure people with ADHD have object permanence. So like, what is the principle of object permanence? Let's talk about this. So object permanence is the awareness that things that I'm not directly perceiving actually continue to exist even though I don't see them. So this is, I don't know if y'all understand this, but the reason that peekaboo is so fun for babies is because they don't have object permanence. So when you play peekaboo and I go like this and you can't see my face, that means that I no longer exist. So when you play peekaboo with a baby, you are literally like flashing in and out of existence in their mind. So they're like, wow, that person just completely disappeared from existence. And now that they come back, they're like popped into existence again. It's, it's wild, right? That's why babies love peekaboo. And if you kind of think about it, like peekaboo stops getting fun at some point, right? And why does peekaboo stop getting fun? Because people develop object permanence. Now, as far as I know, I mean, I could be wrong. Like I'm not, you know, I haven't read all of the scientific papers out there and who knows, maybe this person has looked at a bunch of science on object permanence and has discovered that people with ADHD don't have object permanence, which would blow my mind. Because if that were true, that would mean like, if I had ADHD and like, I didn't see my car, that would mean that I no longer realize that my car existed. Like people wouldn't be able to drive to work because they wouldn't understand that a car exists. The fridge would be like completely empty all the time. It just doesn't make sense. Then they talk about emotional permanence, which means that, you know, if people like don't like you, they assume that they, you assume that they hate you. And this is where I think what's starting to happen is they're conflating a lot of things with ADHD. And here's why this is important. So if... ADHD causes fear of rejection. Why is this like kind of dangerous to do? Because it's true. This is good because it captures a lot of the experience of people with ADHD, which we'll get to why this happens. But here's what bothers me about it. If I treat this, okay? If I treat someone's ADHD, their fear of rejection does not go away. But if it were due to ADHD, it would go away, right? So if like ADHD causes inattention. And then I treat the ADHD. Then this would get better. We'd actually like fix this. Does that make sense? So this is why it's really important to not conflate certain symptoms of ADHD with like, and be clear on what you're treating. Because if someone comes in with a fear of rejection, I treat their ADHD, their fear of rejection is not going to go away. This is going to have to be dealt with independently. So let's understand a couple of things about ADHD in social situations. There have been studies that demonstrate all kinds of really interesting things. So ADHD leads to inattention. There's a whole video about this in the guide, by the way. 
that walks through this, okay? So ADHD leads to inattention. What does inattention do? Inattention means I can't pay attention in conversations. So if I can't pay attention in conversations, I'm going to have difficulty with social relationships. Okay, so there are studies that show that kids with ADHD are invited to birthday parties less than neurotypical kids. So it starts really, really young. If all of my friends are talking about Pokemon and I'm seven years old and like, I'm not paying attention. I don't know what they're talking about. I can't participate in the conversation. And then suddenly I start talking about candy bars. Like everyone's going to look at me like I'm a weirdo because like we're not talking about candy bars. And then other, other, at other times, like one kid is really, really upset because they got bullied on, on, you know, in the, on the playground. And then I start talking about Pokemon because I'm so excited. Kids are going to kind of look at me like I'm a weirdo. And then that's going to lead to Difficulty with social relationships. So literally, there have been studies that show that kids with ADHD get invited to birthday parties less. So what this means is that this inattention then leads to social isolation. This social isolation can, can contribute to depression. We'll share some interesting statistics with you all in a second. This depression then leads to fear of rejection and all this other stuff that the person is talking about. Okay, but this is really important to understand is that this is not a direct consequence of the ADHD. There are like a lot of steps in the middle. And here's what I've seen like as a clinician is that you can treat the ADHD and it'll improve. You know, this stuff will get better. But this is the whole point is that when you're working with someone with ADHD and depression, which they allude to at the end, this has a completely different treatment. This is not going to get touched by treating ADHD. Especially this stuff. So even some of the social isolation, like this, you could argue will improve some as you start to like, you know, get better. So this is what's kind of interesting is that if you look at people who have ADHD and depression, which by the way, there's a very high comor com comorbidity. This is what you find. So for people who have both, if you start with depression as a kid, there's a 3% chance that you will have ADHD as an adult. If you start with ADHD as a kid, there is a 70% chance that you will have depression as an adult. There is a huge causative link here, which is very different. Does that make sense? So this is what's really important about this is like your fear of rejection and abandonment isn't a part of ADHD. It's like a separate process that's a consequence of usually growing up with untreated ADHD. It's huge. Once again, we go into all this, uh, this is all in the guide in a bunch of detail. So if y'all are really curious about that. So how does it lead to depression? Let's just give you a quick spoilerino. So people with ADHD have lower academic achievement, lower social connections, there's even evidence, like we talked about the birthday parties, teachers give them less attention. Teachers give less negative attention. I mean, so, sorry, less positive attention. Right? Because, like, you have trouble in school, so they'll give you attention, but it's, it's like, because you're screwing up. They're not going to encourage you and just say, like, oh, like you're, like, you're so good at this, like, good job. You know, I think you should go to a honors class next year because you've really got talent in it. They don't get this kind of positive attention. Lower academic achievement leads to worse educational performance. This leads to worse job prospects. And then, by the way, Difficulty with social connections also leads to worse job prospects. So there's studies that show that inability to participate in work social situations, like a neurotypical person, leads to lower advancement, lower wages, lower promotions, etc. So this kind of stuff, and then you end up sort of like being behind other people in life, which in turn leads to depression. So the two are very, I, I understand why this person is conflating the two, because oftentimes people with ADHD will experience both of these things. 
The problem is that we've got to be a little bit sophisticated here and recognize that these are actually two separate processes because fixing the ADHD isn't naturally going to make the fear of rejection go away. Yeah, so this is pretty accurate too. So let's kind of talk about this, right? So there's like number one is oversharing in team meetings. This is common. So oftentimes that impulsivity is going to lead to oversharing. Careless mistakes is due to inattention, right? That's what we mean by careless. So it's, it's like a mistake that like you didn't, you weren't paying attention. So you kind of like delete something that you shouldn't have. Now, this is really interesting. So taking on too much responsibility is where we really have to tunnel down. So there are a couple of different reasons why people with ADHD do this. One is that they feel like they're trying to make up for the other stuff, right? So if I make a careless mistake, people think less of me. And what do I have to do to fix that? Oh, this is loud? Dude, it's already so low. Okay. Um, so when we take on too much responsibility, sometimes it's because we feel like we screwed up at work. So we have to make up for it. And then what we end up doing is signing ourselves up for like more stuff, which we are actually kind of digging ourselves into a hole because we kind of make it a careless mistake once. If we take on more responsibility, it doesn't mean that we're not going to make a careless mistake again. So you've got to be really careful about taking on what I would call a compensatory responsibility. Don't take on responsibility to make up for something in the past because you're just kind of really setting yourself up for failure there. The other reason that people take on too much responsibility is because of impulsivity. Right. So remember that in ADHD, our frontal lobes are not as good at planning and executing tasks, which means that we're not really good at sequencing out. OK, I'm going to sign up for the project. What does that mean? Because when my brain assesses risk, assesses resource management, it's like, oh, that's easy. I can take care of that super easy. And so sometimes we'll sign up for stuff and we don't really realize what we're getting into. The other reason that that gets really complicated is part of the reason that we will sometimes sign up for really difficult tasks is because sometimes with people, people with ADHD, you know that you can actually get a ton of stuff done in two hours. Like there was a, a, work, a project at work that was taking other people a week, but like you banged it out in like one day. So sometimes you do have those shining successes, which your brain is aware of. And so it'll sign up for stuff because if you can get all the stars aligned to align, you can knock it out of the park. So this is, this is a really good one that goes into a little bit more, um, you know, s some subtleties there, but good. Only working on projects due tomorrow. Yeah, that's where, I don't know how to say this, but let's take a quick look at this. So when people have ADHD, so we have a tendency to get overwhelmed, right? So our, let's say this is, um, let's say this is like panic and this is effort. So what we essentially do is we'll like use panic to increase our effort. So sometimes people with ADHD will like use last minute panic as something like they need that stress level to get their brain to focus. So maybe this is actually focus is a better thing for this X axis. I mean, Y axis, but this is really common. So this is important. So because of the consequences of inattention and distractibility, sometimes people with ADHD do actually like end up working more, right? So like they spend more time trying to work. This is why if you look at um, things like CBT for ADHD, even part of the clinical treatment for ADHD and psychotherapy actually doesn't involve talking about your feelings. A portion of what's actually really, really effective is, is organizational skills and focusing skills. So that too, we dig into a lot because that's not actually, I mean, it's a part of clinical treatment, but it's not like learning how to use a calendar is not exclusive to psychotherapy, right? But it turns out that if you teach people with ADHD, some of these organizational techniques, it'll boost their productivity and they won't actually have to work extra. So excessive disagreements and arguments with coworkers, this is kind of tricky. So sometimes people with ADHD, this is true of some people, but not others. So a couple of things to think about. 
One is whether you have kind of the emotional dysregulation subtype with ADHD. The other issue is that sometimes you're kind of just not paying attention, right? Or like you're not able to articulate what you're kind of saying. And that can lead to things like disagreements. If you have ADHD and you've been in a relationship where everything was great in the beginning, y'all were spending every single day together, you were doing all these activities, and over time, the effort dropped, right? And you didn't feel any differently about the person, but you just kind of got a little bit busier, right? Or you didn't have as much time to dedicate to doing certain things. Then I want you to know you're not alone, right? With the ADHD brain, a lot of times, the things that fascinate us are things that know either have like a time limit on it there's a deadline coming up or things that are new and exciting right or something that's unpredictable something that keeps us curious and keeps us going so a lot of times in relationships is that same exact way right and what you can do to help prevent this love bombing sort of thing right it's not love bombing but it almost seems like What's that talking thing that you can do is to set boundaries in the beginning right make sure that you're taking some time to spend with yourself as you meet this new person and pace yourself so that way you're not letting somebody you know feel that hurt at the end when the dopamine wears off right so i just thought i'd share that with you wait what let me just make sure i understand this if you have adhd and you've been in a relationship where everything was great in the beginning y'all okay were spending every so relationships together, are great at the beginning doing all these activities and over time the effort dropped right and you didn't feel any differently about the person but effort dropped you just kind of got a little bit busier right or you didn't have as much time to dedicate to doing certain things then i want you to know you're not alone right busy the adhd brain a lot of times the things that fascinate us are things that you know either have like a time limit on it there's a deadline coming up or things that are new and exciting right or something that's unpredictable something that keeps us curious and keeps us going so a lot of times in relationships is that same exact way right and what you can do to help prevent this love bombing sort of thing right okay this is where he loses it almost me. seems like that one thing that you can do is to set boundaries in the beginning right make sure boundaries that you around what time to spend with yourself as you spend some person, time with yourself? yourself so that way you're not letting hey I'm so confused by this. I don't understand the chain of, okay, so like sometimes relationships are, so like I, I understand some pieces of it, but I don't understand all of it. So like, okay, let's just start at the top. So new relationships are exciting. And then over time, they get less exciting. I don't see what that has to do with ADHD. Over time, sometimes we get busier. Also, sometimes we don't. Um, so this kind of makes sense, right? Because he talks about the ADHD brain, like oftentimes where we do things that are more time dependent. That makes a lot of sense. We just talked about procrastination and panic. Um, and we prefer things that are new, exciting, but I don't think that's specific to ADHD. I mean, sure, like people are more distractible, but this is, I don't understand the love bombing. Can someone explain that to me? Like what does love bombing have to do with this? Okay, so he's equating the end of the honeymoon phase with ADHD. And then setting boundaries, pacing yourself. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I, I'm not saying the dude is wrong. I'm just saying I, I, I feel like there's just a lot of regular stuff about relationships here. And like, I feel like people talk about boundaries setting but like, I don't understand the boundary setting thing. Like, I, I don't understand the boundary setting thing. Like, 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 I don't understand the I don't understand what they're saying. I'm not saying it's wrong. It, it, it makes sense, right? So some of the stuff that he's saying makes sense. Like there's, um, you know, the, the pressure on time limits. So maybe like when something isn't new and exciting, like, you know, it, there's no pressure to maintain the relationship. So you kind of fall out of it like that. That makes sense to me. I just don't really, I don't understand the love bombing and the boundary setting. I, I, I don't know what to say about this. I feel like there's, you know, maybe another 30 seconds to really draw out that chain would have been more useful, at least for me. Someone's asking, how do you cure ADHD? So a couple of things to understand. So a lot of psychiatric illnesses we don't really believe are in our model of disease. We don't really believe that, or I mean, you can sort of cure them, but like we don't really know that they can be cured. So some of this may be somewhat organic and somewhat, when I say somewhat permanent, take that with a grain of salt. So here's why. So we know, for example, that the majority of people who experience one depressive episode in their life, I think this is accurate, the most common number of depressive episodes for people who experience depressive episodes is one. So the majority of people that we're aware of, maybe it's not a majority, it could be a plurality, but 
like a lot of people will just experience one depressive episode and it'll like never come back. So that, that number is actually quite high. Um, and I may be wrong on that statistic, but I, I think it's still quite high, even if it's not the most. So does that mean that that person has been cured of depression? Like we're not really sure. In terms of ADHD, so this is really interesting. So when you go through psychotherapy for ADHD, we do know that some portion of people who go through psychotherapy for ADHD will two years out, even after two years after completing psychotherapy, will many of them will not experience any negative impacts from their ADHD. So that's kind of interesting. So that's not true of medication. So what we sort of know is that a lot of times people with ADHD will essentially develop adaptive strategies. They'll start to structure their life in a particular way to where the ADHD no longer impacts them. A good example of this was the whole, like, you know, vegetables in the side drawer and condiments in the vegetable drawer. So people will figure out adaptations to where if you do something like that, you'll no longer, like, waste your veggies, right? So then, like, effectively, you've managed to adapt. So is that a cure? I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's just you learn how to live with the whatever way your brain is, which has nothing to do with ADHD. It's just some people have to learn how to do that. Um, wow, then what is it about the duration factor and depression and ADHD? Yeah, so th that's where things get complicated, right? So, you know, our science is like, okay, but we still don't really understand this stuff too well at the end of the day. Like, we don't understand psychiatry anywhere near as well as what we, like, it, it, we understand, like, cardiology, nephrology, like, you know, we understand these things way better than we understand the brain or the mind. I think the brain and the mind, if you even consider the mind a thing, are like the final frontiers of medicine. They're the organs that we understand the least. It's gotten to the point where, you know, we can breathe without lungs. Like we have ECMO, extracorporeal membranous oxygenation. So like your lungs can be completely gone and you can, we can still keep you alive. We've got dialysis, where your kidneys can be completely non-functional and we can keep you alive. We've learned how to replace those organs. Even to a certain degree, things like cardiac bypass, right? So which will keep people on temporarily. will pump your heart for you. We haven't figured out how to replace the brain yet. And we haven't figured out how to replace the mind. We're not even, there's even debate on whether the mind exists. So... I think there is some surgeon out, maybe in Italy or something, who's trying to do brain transplants or head transplants. How to learn how to... So Ultra Mega Pint is asking, how to learn how to talk better when you have ADHD? My thoughts are often all over the place, and it often puts me in embarrassing situations. Yeah, so this may sound kind of frustrating, but basically you got to practice. So one thing that you can do is write your thoughts out. So like use, so this is the key thing. So a lot of people, okay, let me think about this. Let, let me start with the question again. This is actually a great question. How to learn to talk better when you have ADHD? My thoughts are often all over the place and it often puts me in embarrassing situations. So here's the thing to understand about ADHD. When your brain is different, a lot of people are trying to figure out, okay, how can I learn to talk better? How can I learn something up here that will make my ADHD better? The key thing that a lot of people with ADHD don't get is that the if you want to improve, you don't need to improve up here. You need to improve externally. So a lot of overcoming the deficits of ADHD has nothing to do with learning how to talk better. It has nothing to do with neuroscience. It has everything to do with external tools. So for example, write out your speaking points. How can I learn how to like be less forgetful. You can't learn to be, I mean, maybe you can, you can actually, but that's not actually what has shown scientifically to be the most effective way for people to like be less forgetful. It's not cognitive training. It's actually using external tools like calendars, reminders, things like that. So this is what's really important. If you struggle with ADHD, you don't necessarily need to do the lifting up here. You can do the lifting externally. And for people who start to use those adaptive external strategies, they're the impact of their ADHD goes down in their life drastically. That's why even if you look at cognitive behavioral therapy for ADHD, it, it's not just talking about your emotions. It's like literally a part of that is going to be teaching people how to get organized and how to prioritize. If that makes sense. So oftentimes I think the biggest mistake that people with ADHD make is they try to solve everything up here, whereas you should use an external tool instead, and then you don't have to fix it up here, right?
How do you apply that when talking to someone in the moment? So a couple of different things. One is you can just organize your thoughts a little bit in your head, like explicitly. So, you know, if you train yourself to write things out before you speak, then like as you train yourself in that process, you can sort of do it automatically in your head as well. Or not automatically, but you can do it even without pen and paper. So first I'm going to say this, then I'm going to say this, then I'm going to say this. The next thing, I know it sounds kind of weird, but in the moment, you can also jot it down. Right? In a conversation, you can just like have a notepad and just like jot a couple things down. It may seem weird, but, you know, like, it works well. Like, I'll do that sometimes. Like, I don't know if y'all notice, but when I interview people, like, I'm taking notes. And even when I'm having serious conversations with people, I'll oftentimes whip out a piece of paper and just keep track of stuff. It just looks weird. But like, over time, if someone asks you about it, or you, you can even offer a disclaimer and you can say, hey, like, I just want to keep track of a couple of things because a lot of what you're saying sounds really important. And then is it a little bit odd? Sure. But is it going to cause the negative impact that like verbal diarrhea is going to cause to the conversation? Absolutely not. Especially if you're talking about something like a work meeting, right? If you're sitting in a work meeting and there's a live conversation going on and you're taking notes, no one is going to think that's weird.